Okay, hello, and now we are on to part three of chapter six. Uh, we're going to look at production of ATP. Now, ATP or the generation of ATP is produced in three primary pathways or three primary uh, mechanisms. The first is known as substrate level phosphorylation. In substrate level phosphorylation, a high energy phosphate group is going to be directly transferred to ADP uh, to form ATP. And that transfer is going to occur from an actual substrate within a metabolic pathway itself. Remember that um, a ATP, oops, sorry about that. Get our pen going here. That um, ADP, adenosine diphosphate plus a free phosphate group, that's what P sub I means, results in an ATP, adenosine triphosphate molecule. So when this phosphate group gets transferred to ADP, it is being transferred from one of the intermediates within the pathway. Uh, this is a direct form of ATP production and it occurs during glycolysis and the TCA or Krebs cycle. Oxidative phosphorylation is the electron transport chain. And uh, here, electrons create a proton motive force, and that proton motive force is used to drive uh, an enzyme known as ATP synthase. So this is an indirect form of ATP production. And finally, we have photophosphorylation where light energy is going to be used. And light energy gets converted into chemical energy. That light energy is going to be used to excite electrons in an electron transport chain. This only occurs in photosynthetic cells, and it also requires the use of chlorophyll molecules and structures known as photosystems. So we have three basic forms of generation of ATP. Substrate level phosphorylation during glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Oxidative phosphorylation, which can be in either anaerobic or anaerobic aerobic conditions and is indirect production of ATP through ATP synthase and electrons. Then we have photophosphorylation where light energy is used to overexcite electrons in an electron transport chain. And again, this will require chlorophyll and photosystems, another form of indirect ATP production. So primary metabolism, this is also referred to as the central metabolic pathways all organisms break down glucose. So we all produce essentially the same, um, uh, the same enzymes in these pathways. We use hexokinase in our glycolysis pathway, the same hexokinase that an E. coli cell uses. So for living organisms, central metabolism is a commonality among all organisms that utilize glucose. So we have glycolysis. Within glycolysis, we get some ATP during substrate level phosphorylation. Uh, then we move on to the transition step. And we move on to the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, we will also have substrate level phosphorylation. And uh, this will produce some more ATP. Put that up here. And then we have the electron transport chain. And in the electron transport chain, we use oxidative phosphorylation. So during aerobic cellular respiration, we use two of the three different forms of ATP production. Substrate level phosphorylation directly and then oxidative phosphorylation indirectly. Fermentation is another central metabolic pathway. It involves glycolysis only. There's no transition Krebs or electron transport chain. And there are two different types of fermentation that can occur. Alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. Again, ATP production will occur during glycolysis and it occurs through substrate level phosphorylation. Finally, in prokaryotes only, we have the Entner-Dwardoff pathway and the pentose phosphate pathway. Both of these actually occur with glycolysis and what they do is they replace part of the glycolytic pathway. And again, these are prokaryotic specific and both of them will create some ATP through substrate level phosphorylation. So let's talk a little bit about glycolysis. I call, uh, glycolysis is a 10 step metabolic pathway that is branched. And in steps one through five, this is referred to as the investment phase because we have to input to ATP. So we have to spend a little money to make some money. So in this case, the cell will invest to ATP 
to prepare this, this molecule, this glucose molecule for uh, further oxidation. In steps six through 10, this is referred to the payoff phase. And this is where um, the, uh, the glycolytic pathway or glycolysis will branch, will split. Remember, this is a branched pathway. And each of the molecules in each of those different splits, they are G3P molecules, and they are going to be oxidized enough that each of them will provide two ATP for a total of four. So if we take a look at our diagram here, here we have phase one, this is steps one through five. Down here is our payoff phase, this is steps six through 10. So in steps one through five, which not all of them are shown here, but in steps one through five, we have to input two ATP because we end up putting a phosphate group on either side of the glucose molecule. Finally, when we get to step five, the molecule is cut in half. And I have um, these two G3P molecules right here. They're called glyceraldehyde 3P. Both of these guys will be phosphorylated again, but not from ATP. And when this occurs, we now have phosphates on either end. NAD plus, we're going to break these off. We need to transfer these phosphates to ADP. But in order to do that, and when we do that, an electron is going to be lost. So the, both of these phosphate groups here are going to be transferred to ATP, but to make that happen, NAD+, one of our energy intermediates, must be present in order to harness the electron that's going to be lost when the bond is made between this phosphate and that ADP. So NAD+, is required for ATP production to occur. This will happen twice, one, uh, twice for each of these G3P molecules, and that gives us a total of four ATP. So that when we are done and after this process, the final product of glycolysis, we still have these three carbon molecules called pyruvate. So down here at the bottom, we're looking at net production. Remember, uh, think about a paycheck. You get a gross pay and then they take out all your taxes and all of your insurance and such and then you end up with net pay. So in the net production in glycolysis, we might have produced four ATP, but it cost us two, right? It cost us two to do it. So we actually only produce two ATP. We also end up with two pyruvate molecules and we also end up with two NADHs. So that in glycolysis is an easy way to remember it is two, two, and two, right? So uh, two molecules of pyruvate, two NADH, and two ATP. Here's another diagram showing glycolysis again. This one is a bit more detailed. It shows all of the steps. I do not expect you to memorize the names of all of the intermediates or even all of the enzymes. Um, but what I want you to see is just kind of follow the process. The, the little uh, gray one, gray here, those are carbons. Here you can see ATP is donating one of its phosphate groups. And so that's why this has gone from ATP to ADP. Uh, and then this will happen again so that my six carbon glucose molecule now has a phosphate group on either side. When this gets split in half, I end up with these three carbon molecules and they're going to get altered and these G3Ps will get another phosphate group on it. Here they're breaking down this reaction for you here. So we need this NAD plus in here for this second phosphate group to be added. And then we produce our two ATP per molecule for the total of four minus the two we put in. So we get two pyruvates at the end, two ATPs and two NADH. Now the pentose phosphate pathway, just to, I'm gonna back up a second. The pentose phosphate pathway is used by prokaryotes to use five carbon sugars in glycolysis and the pentose phosphate pathway will run at the same time as glycolysis. It produces a final product of glyceraldehyde 3P or G3P and we saw that in glycolysis earlier. During this process we do get one ATP uh, and two of the intermediates in this process will be used in biosynthetic pathways. But let's move back here. What I want to show you is here's that G3P right here. 
And so pentose phosphate will occur here and then enter into central metabolism at this place, at step five, right? At step five of glycolysis. So five carbon sugars cannot occur in this pathway here. They get broken down over here and then enter into the investment phase of glycolysis. So that's the pentose phosphate pathway. And again, I'm not gonna ask you to um, answer uh, all of those names of the enzymes or anything like that. I just want you to understand it. in the pentose phosphate pathway, we're just simply using five carbon sugars in steps one through five. Then of course we have the Entner-Dwardoff pathway. The Entner-Dwardoff replaces the first half of glycolysis as well. So in this case, in, in Entner-Dwardoff, it's an alternative to uh, glycolysis. The Entner-Dwardoff is used primarily by gram-negative organisms and it is used instead of, right? So it's going to be used instead of glycolysis. Uh, it really just replaces steps one through five. Again, we get one ATP, and if you see, we get one ATP. It's using glucose, it's just um, moving it differently, uh, rearranging it, using a different set of enzymes. So here we have all three of them. If you notice, right here, uh, from here down, this is going to be um, glycolysis. And this is basically steps five through 10. Steps one through five, we can either use the uh, glycolysis right here. We can use the Entner-Dwardoff pathway instead of glycolysis, or we can use the um, uh, pentose phosphate. Now, the pentose phosphate will work in conjunction with glycolysis, but all three of these different pathways, remember these two here are bacteria specific or bacteria only. And these two pathways here both result in a final product of G3P, which is also the final product of steps one through five in glycolysis. So we're looking for this guy right here. So let's look at our metabolic scorecard. In metabolism, we oftentimes keep score of the ATP that's being produced. So in metabolic accounting, in glycolysis, we end up with two pyruvate, two ATP, two NADH, no FADH2. This energy intermediate has not been produced um, yet. Now, so each pathway is going to contribute a certain amount of ATP and energy intermediate in um, uh, aerobic cellular respiration. That brings us to the transition step. The transition step is a, um, a one-step metabolic pathway. It would be linear, but there's only one step in it. It utilizes an enzyme called acetyl-CoAce. Acetyl-CoAce will actually bind with pyruvic acid. This is also pyruvate. And in doing so, we produce an energy intermediate a carbon is going to be removed from pyruvate. Notice we have three carbons here. Oops, one, two, three. And down here we only have two. These two carbons will be attached to, to the CoA enzyme, creating what's known as acetyl-CoA. And uh, the carbon will be lost in the form of CO2. And during this process, an, an electron will be released, so that electron gets harnessed by NAD+. And so we now have uh, CO2, NADH, and acetyl-CoA. Now, each time a pyruvate moves through, this is going to occur. So for each glucose molecule, I ended up with two pyruvates. So that means from transition step from a single glucose molecule, I should get two NADH, two acetyl-CoA. Notice in the transition step, there is no ATP production. There's no substrate level phosphorylation and no, um, no ATP production. So if we look at our metabolic scorecard now, I still only have two ATP molecules, but now I'm up to four NADH molecules and I still don't have any FADH2. Now, finally, we move on to the TCA cycle. 
Uh, the TCA cycle is known as the Krebs cycle or sometimes referred to as the citric acid cycle. And in the TCA, we finally complete the oxidation of glucose, and that's its primary function. When we think about the function of it, uh, these two right here, NADH and FADH2, are grouped together, and this would be production of energy intermediates. So production of electron carriers or energy intermediates, production of ATP, even though we only get two, and production of precursor metabolites, uh, intermediates in the pathway that will leave the pathway to move out and become something else. Two acetyl-CoA from our transition step for each glucose molecule will enter into the TCA cycle. So the TCA cycle, it is a cyclic metabolic pathway. Here on the left, here is our acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters into the TCA cycle and the coenzyme A will be released and the molecule continues, it actually becomes citric acid. As our, our, um, as our molecule moves, as this altered glucose molecule gets oxidized over and over and over again, remember oxidation is the removal of electrons. So as it gets oxidized, um, NADH is going to be removed. Remember, we have two pyruvates entered into transition steps, so that means two acetyl-CoAs are going to enter into the TCA cycle. So everything you see here is times two. So we end up with two, um, well, actually three, six. So we end up with six NADH, two ATP, and two FADH2s because this cycle is going to turn twice for every glucose molecule. So this is per glucose. That's a six. So now that we move to our metabolic scorecard, we still, only, now we only have four ATP, right? We've gone through these, all three of these, um, and through substrate level phosphorylation, we've only produced four ATP from a single glucose molecule. However, we've produced 10 NADH and two FADH2s. So these 12 energy intermediates are the ones that harness the electrons. We have oxidized glucose. The whole point of these processes was to strip as many electrons off of glucose as we possibly could. So in review of central metabolism, um, in terms of glycolysis, transition step, and Krebs cycle, here's just a couple of review questions that you want to ask yourself. Maybe write these down, take a screenshot, um, uh, and answer these questions to help prepare for your exam. So that's the end of part three in uh, uh, microbial metabolism, and I will see you guys in part four.